Welcome, everybody. This is uh, like our 30th webinar. Incredible. Uh, joining us today is, of course, me and Megan, who you've probably seen before if you've seen any of the previous webinars for product support specialists with high end systems. And joining us is a super awesome and special guest, Sarah Clawson. Uh, oh my. <laughs> I, we think you're special. Uh, <laughs> do you want to maybe introduce yourself briefly and, and tell everybody kind of what your role is with high end systems and Hey everyone, uh, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> I am the uh, marketing product manager for the Hog Four family for High End Systems, which means that it is my job to listen to all you folks when you have stuff to say, um, and then hopefully to take your commentary and uh, you know the market needs as we perceive them and turn them into products and specifications that uh, hopefully will solve problems for you in the field. So. I think that's basically what we're talking about today in the in the launch we recently announced. Um, but even outside of this webinar or whatever, if y'all need to get in touch with me, please feel free to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, if you can see my name on the screen, it's sarah.clausen at etcconnect.com or sarah.clausen at highend.com. Either one will get you to me if you have stuff to tell me. So I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Oh, and tonight, actually. <laughs> Sarah's actually in Germany. That's right. I am in Germany. So, That's right. It's lunchtime for you guys. So Yeah. It is. It's noon here over in central Texas. I'll try to be time neutral. Um, I apologize for no video, but it's my network, and I swear to God, if I if I turn my video on, my network will tank, and I hate it when that happens. So. Yeah, let's knock on wood there. Um, <laughs> so... This webinar, it'll probably be a little bit of a shorter webinar than uh, our previous ones, but we just released software version 3.14.0 for the HOG4 uh, family of consoles, and it introduced a lot of new things. So we're just going to take the time to answer any questions that anybody has. We're going to go through the release notes, talk about some new products that are also have been announced with this release. We actually have uh, three new hardware products. We have a brand new HPU. Uh, rack mount console in a box, basically. And then we also have a revised uh, Roadhog and a revised Hedgehog. So we're going to talk about kind of all of that in this webinar. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to just pop them into the Q&A and we'll try to answer them uh, as they come up. So to start, I'm going to share with everybody the release notes. So this is essentially the release notes. It comes out with every release of uh, our software that we come out with. A uh, couple of things to note that this release will be a full install release. So you will not be able to just um, add in the FPS KPG upgrade. You actually have to completely uh, uh, wipe the console and add in the new operating system. So you will have to create a etcher drive to uh, or a USB drive and format it in order to install to the console. If you've never done that before, uh, we have instructions on our website as well as in the user manual for how to do it. It's really quite straightforward. Um, um, and I wanna add for Hog4 PC, just install over your old version. Sometimes uh, new users just get a little bit confused because we say full install required for the consoles and don't really mention PC. Just install over and you'll be good. Correct. Um, in regards to show file compatibility, so this is a sort of show file blocker release. So what that means is that if your show file touches 314, you cannot take your show file back to an earlier software version. So for the last about five software releases we've had, I think from like 3.9 to 3.13.1, you were able to take your show file backwards and forwards. Uh, just because we've introduced some new sort of functions in this release, you'll not be able to take your software from 314 back. And what that means is if you download Hawk 4 PC at home and you download the latest version and you're running some pre-programming and things like that, you just need to be cautious because if you take it to a console that's not running 314, uh, you're going to have to update it because your show file has already touched this 314 update. So something that we kind of keep in mind uh, that is always listed in the release notes at the very top. Another thing related to that is um, if you're considering just, you know, updating 314 to see what the heck happened before you do a show that evening, that's actually not recommended this time around. Um, this software release touches the patch 
which means it touches a pretty significant portion of your show and it affects your workflow. Um, it's not something to learn in a half hour before half hour. So if you are making an upgrade of a console that's in a show situation, I actually recommend that you stay in the software you're in unless you have a really good reason and time enough to invest in making the change to the 314 workflow, um, partly because of this show file compatibility thing, but also because it's just it's going to feel a lot different to you and you probably want to take some time to watch the tutorial video that I'm sure Megan's going to give you the link for here in a bit. Uh, and get comfortable with the new way of working. And we'll go through all of that here in this webinar. Um, so you'll get an introduction to that. But uh, this is not a Friday afternoon update. <laughs> no. And if for somehow it makes it on your ISO stick, on your full install stick, because we always recommend carrying one around, um, and you were being good and preemptively updated it, you can't. we do have 24-hour support if you need it. Um, <laughs> just give the high-end number a call, and we'll get you taken care of from there. But as Sarah said, it is recommended to, you know, take some time, learn what the release does, not 30 minutes before a show, show. Right. And this is really a support release. It's not like a big feature release. Uh, it's, it's really meant to support the new hardware Correct. and a couple of just, you know, sort of minor changes here. So it's not a like essential update where you have to install. Uh, it is really just if you like the new patching scheme, you could definitely install it. Or if you have any of the new hardware, you would have to be on it. For example, the new HPU console, the absolute most minimal software version that can run on will be 3.14. So just keep that in mind. Yep. Um, so let's let's talk about the HPU. Uh, Sarah, do you want to kind of, since it's your baby, do you want to kind of bring up a couple points on it? Sure. Do you want to show them a pretty picture? Free picture. Um, so we've, we've been contemplating this particular device for a, a seemingly very long time now. Um, the sort of world got in the way of its release. It should have been in your hands a lot sooner than this. But um, basically, we are, we're facing uh, an end-of-life situation on both the Rackhog 4 product and the DP8K product. Um, so this HPU device that you see in front of you now is a 2U rack mount device that replaces both Rackhog and DP8K products. Those products retire, and this one takes over um, for both of them. Those two products continue to be supported in software, so if you have them, do not panic. Uh, we will continue to support them uh, throughout their continuing life in the field. We simply uh, won't be selling new ones of them anymore. <clears throat> so what is cool about the HPU, a couple things. One, it's got these really cool blue LEDs on the face panel, which I love. Uh, but the really cool part about it is a 2U device. It's got a multi-touch screen on the front, full color, that you can see runs the software. So you have access to the full software environment within this tiny screen. I would not recommend running your entire show from it, but you can actually do quite a few things uh, right here from the front panel. Um, but the big news about it is that this 2U box is a 64 universe device. So we have broken the 16 universe limit on most of the products that are in the HOG4 range, and we've gone to 64 universes here in this guy. Um, the other thing that you'll want to know is how much it costs, and I'm going to tell you that you will get a very accurate price if you contact your high-end systems dealer. Um, but know that our list price in pounds, euros, and dollars is under 10000 so get in contact with your high-end systems dealer if you want to know how far under 10,000 this thing comes uh, for those 64 universes of output. And that is both in rack hog or console mode where it's running the full system or in processor mode when it's just taking that role of, of DMX processing on to expand other products. Uh, things you need to know about this is unlike the rack hog, this box doesn't have any built-in MIDI or SMPTE connections. Uh, we made a change a couple versions ago, I think, or it was in 3.13, um, where we now allow multiple MIDI inputs or multiple timecode inputs into the system. So we would simply use widgets in this particular case to get as many inputs into the HPU as you need. Uh, there are eight ports of 5-pin DMX on the back panel that you can see there, and then all the rest of the connections, including... USB 3, um, your dual network connections, et cetera. There are also two DisplayPort connections on the back of the HPU, so it will support two monitors. And those can be touch or regular monitors, whatever you want. Uh, and it will support all the wings. So if you have a Nano, if you have a Hoglet, you can put a nice face panel on this 
box and have a pretty screaming system uh, that's quite portable. Uh, if you are wondering about EtherCons, which is usually a question that pops up right about now, we do have an option for those of you who might want to use EtherCon cable with this box, or if you're worried about the fact that all the connections are now on the back instead of the front, like you had on your DPAK, uh, <clears throat> we have an accessory that you can add to your HPU called the port replicator. And that's literally what it does. It, it has cables on it that are long enough to reach up to um, a stack of two HPUs. So if you have two port replicators and two HPUs, they will uh, fit together quite nicely in a rack. You have your eight DMX ports on the front then, and then two EtherCon ports for your Ethernet connections. And that just comes all to the front of the rack. Um, if you want to move power to the front, that's also an option. There's two expansion ports there that you can take the covers off and put whatever connector you want there. Um, if you're going to go for a larger stack of HPUs and want to make another set of port replicators, that would be something that you'd probably want to do on your own where you can get all the connections to the top or the bottom of your rack. But if you just have two, then this accessory will do that for you. Uh, along with the release of the HPU, we are retiring the super duper widget, which is the eight port USB widget. Uh, partly because it's made of parts that are used in the DPAK, and that's the thing that's going away. So we're taking the super duper widget away as well. And as an option for you to bring those DMX ports or to expand the DMX connectivity of your HPU, we're recommending the use of ETC response DMX gateways. Noah has a picture of two of them here in the rack mount kit. Um, takes up the same amount of space as your super duper widget would, but these are now network devices which means you can configure them however you wish uh, for inputs, well, not inputs, but outputs in whatever uh, mapping you want for streaming ACN use. And I think that is it. Did I forget anything, guys? Um, I think I think that was a fantastic explanation. I think <laughs> one, one small difference is, you know, the HPU is kind of a combination of a rack hog and a DP. Uh, I, I can't remember if you, I mean, you, you did talk about MIDI, but yeah, I did. MIDI's, not, MIDI's not included, but that's because we can support multiple MIDI devices. So you can simply put a, a MIDI widget or any other device and put it in the rack mount as well. So just, there's, it's just no longer in that device, whereas the rack hog did have it installed. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's our, our new fancy product, 64 universes. Uh, Megan, do you have anything else you want to add about it? I, I think I think that covered it pretty well. Yeah, no, I think that covered it well. Um, and then we'll talk about processor mode a little bit further on in this, but no, but we'll like I said, we'll talk about that in a minute because the um, for three fourteen we have the ability to do processor mode, which like I said, we'll talk about soon. Uh, so some other products that are also new with the 314 update is we do have a new Roadhog 4. It's actually called the Roadhog 421 because it has a 21 inch uh, monitor on it. It is essentially the exact same as the existing Roadhog. The only difference is it actually has two monitor outputs that are also display ports. Uh, so that, once again, just like the HPU, will only work on 314 going forward. Uh, as far as upgrading an existing Roadhog, is you know sending it into high-end systems that actually will not be feasible, just because so many parts have have turned in. Uh, so you would actually wouldn't be able to upgrade from the uh, older Roadhog to the new Roadhog, just in the same way that you couldn't upgrade from the old Hog Four to the new Four Eighteen console. Uh, we also have a new Hedgehog version, which will actually also have two monitor outputs that are going to be Display Port. Uh, that upgrade process is currently TBD. Uh, so look for an update maybe later, but currently we're not exactly sure uh, pricing and other uh, factors involved as far as upgrading to a newer hedgehog. Um, yeah, anything anything else on that? That's just really just a, a board revision and stuff like that. If any of you uh, uh, went through the transition from Hog 4 to Hog 418, you know that those screens became larger um, and had more pixels on them and that may have had some effect on your screen layouts or on um, key press macros. You don't have to worry about that if you go from a Roadhog 4 to a Roadhog 421. The show files are completely compatible in that case. The new monitor is a new high res monitor. It's slightly smaller than the original monitor, but has more pixels on it. So everything maps out uh, just right. So you don't have to do any of those adjustments in going between those two desks. So they really are 
quite equivalent to each other um, in as far as your show file goes and everything else. Um, does anyone else have any questions about the hardware side of things? If anyone listening and watching has any questions. I think my Q&A might have broke. So I might pop open a new one, hopefully. Yeah, I can't scroll my Q&A anymore. What are the ports on the far right? Those are for future expansion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, multi-touch on the consoles moving forward. Matt, I knew I could count on you. Uh, that is on my list. It is something that I do very much want to achieve uh, on these products. We um, are in the process of doing some infrastructure work in the system that should make that an easier thing for us to implement in a future version. Someday, I promise, before I die. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're switch back to the release notes. Um, so also mentioned in the release notes is we have a, I'm going to come back to the start screen, but we actually have a new sort of mode called processor mode. And so this can be found on the start screen and this is, uh, on all consoles. So regardless of the new ones or the older ones, all consoles will have this new processor mode. And essentially it's, it's basically works like a DMX processor. So like the DP 8,000 that we've had previously, uh, some people wonder, well, why would I want to use processor mode versus networking two consoles together? So you have a, a couple of different uh, scenarios and situations. So if you had, say, a Roadhog, which supports eight universes, and then you were to connect that to a, another Roadhog, you would get an additional eight universes, so 16 total. Uh, previously, you could network the two of them together. However, if you logged out of the show on one of them, and you wanted to switch over to a different show file, you would actually physically have to go over to the other Roadhog, log it out, log it back in, and reconnect it to the show. Uh, with processor mode, it uh, is not connected to the show in that sort of console regard. It's just basically outputting DMX. So this is good if you have a console that's maybe backstage or maybe in the air, you know, somewhere where you just can't access it as easily, and it will just basically keep looking for a show file on the network. If you're familiar with how the DP8000 works, it's basically just that exact same functionality, but on a console. Um, it, it's also pretty useful in the fact that if you just need a like to expand universes, you can quickly add in universes then, if, especially if you have a, a Nomad key and like a PC and you really just need like a bonus four universes or a bonus 12 universes, you can then... Um, you know, hook that up, get going, run the PC in processor mode, and you now have those extra 12 universes. So um, cool. Can um, we hold I, some questions ahead. real quick now There's that two questions. was mentioned? Um, is there a particular startup order with HPU and console? Um, I guess it depends on what mode you're running in, Matt, with the H HPU. If you're running in if the HPU is in console mode and you're running your show file as the HPU being the main server, then that needs to be the first thing booted up. Um, in processor mode, if it's powered on, you, I mean, it'll be like a DP8K. You're pro you can keep it on. If you power it on first, launch the show, it'll be found on the network. Um, so pretty, like the first one, I think. Um, yeah, processor mode, exactly like your DP8K. I would suggest running it. I mean, I just turn I, at that point, I think it just depends on what when you want to turn it on. Unless I'm, you'll have other thoughts. Um, and then can you add a Nomad key to the HPU? Um, it's maxed at 64 universes, just like all the other hardware. The only reason you'd ever want to add a Nomad key to the HPU or to any other console is if you have to use uh, ETC gadget to yeah. um, DMX distribution. So if you wanted to use a gadget to unit with a console or an HPU, you would also need to use that Nomad key um, to enable that gadget to to function with the desks. It's not a that's not a big selling feature. It is a possibility. That's why we don't talk about it that much. Um, but it does not expand the output of any of the products when you use it in that fashion. 
I forgot about needing the gadget and see that's what I mean. It's like when do you do that? Yeah. But it, I mean, if you have access to gadget twos and you want to add them to your to your desk to get more DMX ports of licensed universes that you already have, then that key is required. Um, there's a question about road hugs that were made in the Barco years. Yes, they should support three fourteen just fine. Any, as any, any of the Hog 4 family would. Uh -huh. um, okay, so yeah, just a, just a new mode. Once again, all consoles in the Hog 4 product line will support it, uh, as well as Hog 4 PC. Uh, so we do have a sort of new startup splash screen when uh, you start up either on console or on Hog 4 PC. I'm actually going to go ahead and switch this over to my or PC setup so that we can actually take a look at how it all works. So let's go ahead and switch there to the left-hand screen. So this is the sort of new uh, front panel screen. What I really like about it is it just has everything that you're looking for right there up front, including the Hognet IP, your fixture net IP, as well as your software version. So you don't have to go look for that anywhere. All that information is right there. Your existing buttons, new show, launch show, and browse, those haven't changed, uh, but we do have that new start processor mode. So if I click it, it'll kick over here, kick up my other screen, and there you go. If we're just running as a processor, it's actually just looking for a show on the network currently. Uh, obviously, I don't have one, so it's just going to kind of sit in this state. Um, go and quit. The uh, control panel and the file browser are over here on the right now. Uh, there's no longer the uh, settings. There used to be a settings button here for your startup settings that has actually been moved to the control panel. So you'll have to open up the control panel and then there is now the startup tab. So if you needed to configure nano mode or run your visualizer or any of those settings for uh, that, you can as well as uh, auto launch and some other various functions. So if you're looking for where that settings button uh, used to be, it's now been moved into the control panel on the front splash screen. Um, yeah, anything else you guys want to talk about before I launch into a new, sh a new show? L let's launch. Let's do it. I'm going to launch into a show. And give me a second to let it come on. All right, so we're in a new show. There's uh, a couple of changes as far as how things uh, look, uh, specifically in the uh, patching window and in the uh, output window. So uh, let's just go ahead and just patch in some fixtures. Let's do some 2000s. And this is, this is one of the things, well, Noah's getting them added in. Um, this is one of the things that Sarah was saying, like, it might take some time, just be time and you want to, you know, work out your workflow with this new software because of the difference here in patching and output mapping and all that good stuff that's going to happen. Yeah, so I've, I've added some fixtures that hasn't changed at all. But when you start into patching, you'll notice a couple of differences. Um, so now your patch at screen, it does look a little different. Um, it's, it used to be that you had individual universes going from left to right. Now they are going down. Um, so a couple of kind of new bits of information here. Um, I'm just going to go and hit OK. And it's going to patch into the two universes. Uh, so that is going to hopefully be pretty straightforward. It just looks a little different, but function functionally patching is still working the exact same way. Uh, we have changed uh, a button in here called View by DP, and we now call it Universe View. So we can now actually name your universes. So if you want to name your universes by location or a fixture type or anything like that, uh, you can go in and name your universes. Uh, by default, they will be uh, numbered or and or lettered, essentially. Uh, so you can go in and rename your universes. There's a handy dandy quick name and rename option as well. Um, so this Let's is talk for a second about what these universes actually are, because in the past you were actually patching to ports on DMX processors and those ports may be corresponding to DMX outputs on the back of your console, or they're corresponding to DMX ports on the back or front of your DPAK 
or they may be uh, ports that correspond to Ethernet distributed, you know, streaming ACN or ArtNet universes. Um, but in that case, in this situation, Universe 1 was like the first port on the back of your desk, right? Um, so it had a very direct connection to the wire that you were going to plug into a piece of hardware. That's not the case anymore. These Universe 1, Universe 2, these are inside the Hog 4 system. They We haven't actually gotten to the point yet where we're talking about where is this universe going to come out into your lighting system. Um, so... This has been a request that's been out there for quite some time to try and break away from the idea that your patch is attached to a DP. Um, so all of these universes you see here, they could be numbered 1 through 12, but they could also be numbered whatever the heck you want. And hopefully Noah will get to that in a second. Um, that's why you're not seeing view by DP anymore, because right now we're not talking about a DP. We're talking about the patch within your show file by universe. And I'll step out again. And then, you know, like, for example, I have 12 universes currently uh, for the show. You can actually go in and add additional universes if you need to. Once again, that's, you know, dependent on, say, hardware. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at... You can the... add as many universes as you need to, though, I right. should say. It's not dependent on what hardware you have. You can add as many as you want. Correct. Um, and then you decide in the output mapping part what actually gets output. So like Sarah said... Um, ju just to reiterate what Sarah said, it patch, you can patch to your heart desire, whatever you want there, however many universes you want to patch, you can patch there. Then we have to do the second part, which is actually deciding what you actually want to output and where you want to output that. All right. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that. So that will be in the network window. So you can hit set up network or my preference is always to double click and hit the network button. Uh, so here are our various items on our HogNet network. I personally like this little punch card view. It just kind of shows, in my opinion, a better uh, uh, version of it. We've changed, once again, it used to say DMX processor here. It is now just processor. Uh, so the processor for basically this Hogwarts PC setup I'm on. So you right click on there and you go into settings. Uh, a couple of tabs have disappeared. So it used to be that we had a DMX widgets tab. We used to have an ArtNet output tab, an ArtNet, or sorry, a streaming ACN tab. Uh, all of that has just sort of been merged into one tab for output. So this is where you go to essentially assign your outputs for your universes. Uh, now I do have a Hoglet 4 connected to the system, so that's why it actually went ahead and already had them included, the super widget built into the Hoglet 4. I'm just going to select them and then remove them, just so that we can start from a, a blank slate. Uh, what's, once again, really cool about this uh, update is that previously, if you had a widget, you could map the ports on a widget pretty easily. Uh, but if you were on a console or a DP8K, the ports were sort of hard locked. So the first port was universe one, two is two, three is three, four is four. Uh, that has completely changed. So if you're on a Roadhog, which has four physical ports of five pin DMX, if you want them all to be universe one, you can do that. If you want the first one to be one, the second one to be one, and the next one to be two, and then two, and you want to split left and right, you can do that as well. So your ports are no longer sort of locked on a per universe priority. Um, so what you can do is you can go in and you can add your mappings. So a, a widget is if you have a physical widget or if you have a port on a console, that's going to be a widget. Whereas ArtNet and streaming ACN are going to be over Ethernet protocol. So if you're communicating with an ArtNet node or a streaming ACN, streaming ACN node, uh, like the response gateway node that we talked about earlier on in the webinar. And so, a widget is also a gadget. Got it. Um, so we'll just, we'll add this. I'll, let's just add in. Just add in 20 universes. Why not? So we're going to say adding in universes 1 through 20 as a widget, and we'll press OK. Um, actually, it should have... You can only add in widget... You, know, you can only add in the number of widgets for actual hardline widgets you have. So because you only have four... You have a super widget built in, you have four widgets. Um, so to get all 20 universes, you would also have to add in a either an, an ArtNet output would also get them then. I have a Nomad license as well, but I guess that wouldn't count for the widget either. That's right. No, because that's a ArtNet or SACN unlock. That's right. Without a, without gadgets. 
This is why you want to spend a little time with this software. <laughs> you do a shot with it. I, even I spend time with it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. This is how this works. Yeah, um, widget mapping is always tied to hardware you 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 pretty much have. And then the streaming ACN and Artnet allow you to um, map to those Ethernet protocols. And then we'll talk about what a licensed universe is. Um, but notice, even though even though we have this mapping thing going on, right? Because mapping is about where is it going to be output in your system. It, it requires some kind of physical output, whether that's an Ethernet output or or a widget output. Um, you can still patch all twenty of those universes in the show file and prep your show, right? The mapping is all about when I get to the venue or when I get to the console, which cable goes in which port on my processors, or widgets or gadgets or whatever. All right, carry on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you can, once again, you can go in and you can map the ports if you need to. So I'll actually just, I'm going to remove these and pretend that I want everything to go to uh, universe one to go to all these ports. So I'm just going to say widget on one. I'm just going to do that two more times, three more times. And so this is a scenario of where I want my four, my, my universe ones to actually output to port one, two, three and four. If that's the situation that I had, if I have multiple ports, but I'm only using one universe, I could do it in that regard. Um, so I'm gonna hit remove. And uh, I actually have a Nomad license, but I'm gonna unplug it just for right now. And I'm actually gonna also unplug my hub. So I should technically right now on Hog4 PC have no output because I don't have any sort of high systems hardware that would unlock it. And let's go ahead and add in just do 10 universes of streaming ACN. And so here we are, we've added them in. However, we have a little yellow triangle. So that means that you've added a mapping, but there isn't a license priority for it. Uh, so if I plug back in my hardware, it should hopefully refresh. Because the hoglet will get me four universes of both physical 5 and DMX, but as well as uh, Artnet and streaming ACN. So uh, do kind of just keep that in mind that if you have a yellow exclamation mark, it's, it's probably because you don't have hardware that can support past that point, uh, or maybe it's not connected properly, like the USB cable is loose, or it's just not being detected. It could be a driver issue, something like that. Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to unplug it now to go back to that. And I have a Nomad license, which is an ETC product. This will unlock 12 universes of streaming ACN and Artnet. If I plug it in. Plug it in. Go. Oh, good. And it worked. Um, but if I go past, say, so I'll start at 11. And if I go past 12, I'll just go to 20 again. You'll see I've got my first 12. Uh, but once again, you can assign these to be to go to wherever you you need them to. Uh, you can just hit set in there and decide what what port you want them to go to. Uh, for example, if you are not actually outputting to streaming AC in universe number one, uh, I know a lot of times people like to start at universe 101 because they're coming in on a stage that's not theirs or for whatever reason. Uh, you can go in and just simply change the port assignment around, uh, and it actually is, where'd you go? Did I type in 101 or you, you typed in one. You typed in one. 101. There you go. Yep. Uh, so you can go in and do that. Uh, and once again, any of your streaming ACN settings that you had previously, uh, like your priority, your per channel priority, uh, your destination, uh, that can all be determined in this window as well. Can you add an ArtNet? Sure. Just so that we can see what that looks like also. Because I know a lot of as much as we love SAC and on this side of the, the webinar, I know that everyone and I know that lots of people encounter ArtNet at the same time as well. Right. So let's do universe one through twenty as an ArtNet. We'll hit OK. Once again, the Nomad license supports 12 universes of ArtNet and streaming ACN. So um, you can once again, if you need to change your destination of your output, you can do that here by typing in a specific IP address or you can broadcast it as well as your uh, port numbers for your ArtNet output. Um, and then, so the number in the parentheses, which we've never shown before in HOG, is your decimal number. So like on 
Um, I know like the Solar Series fixtures, when you do Artnet in, you get that one single universe number. That is this number here, that decimal number. So you're no longer doing the conversions from Artnet subnet universe. You're just, you can just take that universe number and put it in here, um, which is pretty nifty. Um, and as per usual, you can also do a, um, as per usual, you can also do Artnet, SACN, and DMX all at the same time if you need to. I know we've been um, unmapping, removing the mapping and adding in the mappings at the same time, like one at a time, but you can do multiple protocols for the same universe if you need to. So why don't you show that? No, yeah, there you go. <laughs> My head, I got it. I got it. So I, I added in 13 universes, once again, because the Nomad license supports the 12. That's why I added in the unlucky number 13. So you Dude, sort by in. universe. Uh, you can output uh, via Artnet and streaming ACN. And of course, if you had a widget of five pin output at all at the same time. Uh, so you can, if you are outputting to multiple types of destinations, you can still do that. Um, Jared Cohello asked a question. Do you want to? Yeah, I was going to say, um, so he's asking, and I actually wanted to bring this up. Um, are we still locked down to hard universe counts or number of parameters used total? Hog is still locked to hard universe counts. So you have a total. Noah here with his Nomad key plugged in has 12 universes to use. They're just now not 1 through 12. They can be 101 through 112. However you get to the number 12, it does not matter. You just can't go above 12 for outputting. Again, you can patch past 12 universes. You just can't output past 12 universes. Right. I hope that makes so sense. You could, you know, if you wanted to call it hog universe, we'll start at 51 and we'll go to, I don't know, let's go 64. 63. Yeah, that's fine. 60, yeah. Uh, so once again, we'll hit OK. So even though you're outputting hog universe 51, 52, 53, all the way to 62, uh, that is, uh, that can still be output. And that's where this sort of license priority comes in. Do you want to, can we elaborate more on, do you want to elaborate more on license priority? Sure. Um, license priority is basically just dependent on the, the hardware that you have, whether it be of a Nomad license, you have a console connected. Uh, that's basically what sort of unlocks it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I wasn't understanding what you were trying to imply. Well, this you is to expand on license priority. Yes, yeah. Sarah, can you expand on license priority? <laughs> right. So um, new concept. So it is a bit of a new concept, but you, I think Noah's demo showed it reasonably well in that you know as he plugged and unplugged his hoglet or his um, Nomad dongle, you could see those little yellow warning signs go away and you could see how many of those universes he was actually going to be allowed to output. Each of these license priorities you could think of as like a slot uh, in your system. And when you, if, if you are in a situation, like if he had patched for the Nomad dongle and had 12 universes of stuff patched, uh, but then for whatever reason ended up in a venue where he only had the hoglet and only had four universes of output license, you can use those those numbers to determine which four of those 12 universes are going to be the ones that get output. So if he had patched in a way that I would probably have patched, I'd put all my most important stuff in universes one through four, but I know that the world doesn't always turn that way. Um, and then automatically the first four universes would be the ones that that hoglet is allowed to put out. And those would be those most important, right? Front lights, stage lights, overheads, whatever. Um, but if you need to mix it up a bit because your system's a bit more flexible, all you really have to do is go in and change those priorities and that will move move universe 60 onto one of your licensed outputs. Um, so for example, if, yeah, go to one that we can see, like if you go to your universe 61 or whatever, yeah, and give it a number between one and four, it bounces up in the list. So now he's outputting hog universes, 51, 52, 61, and 60 on those four ports. OK, if the system were to get smaller, right, if he were to lose his hoglet and instead end up with a two universe ETC Nomad basic dongle, universes 51 and 52 would be the ones that are licensed for output. They still they're still patched. They're still in the show file. They're still available in the case that he gets an upgraded dongle or he adds a, an HPU to the system or whatever. Those universes can be remapped 
onto whatever hardware corresponds to the dongle, the console, the HPU, the DPAK, whatever. Um, this is just managing how those universes get sent out into the rig. Uh, so the most important thing to know is basically the ones with the little yellow warning symbol are not being actively output by this system we're looking at right now because they don't have a licensed output to go out on. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Much better explanation. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. I, You're welcome. I just wanted to make sure we talked about license priority because again, it's a new concept. Um, Matt had a question before we keep going right. through. Um, where do we specify SACN and ArtNet IP addresses if we need to go from broadcast to like unicast, for example? So yeah, that's where your destination is. So you can uncheck multicast. And if you wanted to put in a specific IP address, you could. So if you needed to do that, and the same applies for ArtNet. So I will remove those and we'll just say do another ArtNet universe. Uh, same thing if you wanted to output to a specific destination, do what I want. Uh, that's where this destination uh, section is for. I think that answers it. Yep. Um, so you basically just tap on that cell and press set, and then you can change it there. And then if you did have a, uh, uh, multiple consoles or multiple widgets, that's also where you'd go on what device your destination. Um, and just to reiterate, Aaron asked this, and it's worth it to say it out loud. If you need to change my, if you need to change outputs of one through four to 101 through 104, this is exactly where you would do it right here in this mapping window. Probably something like that. Except I'd probably change where, well, I guess it is one on one. It just depends on, it just depends on where your, your destination is really. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that your outputs is your destination. Like you're trying to change your outputs as destination, That this is where you would change the destination for it. There should be in theory, no more having to clone and unclone universes. You should be able to just change your routing here. Or put in additional routing if you wish. Yes, exactly. Right, just as just as he showed, putting all universe one onto all four ports of your of your super widget, or as we've got here right now, those four universes are all being output on a, on a DMX port on a on a widget, and on two Ethernet based protocols all at the same time, and that all fits within the four universe license that his hoglet is allowing him to have. And if you wanted to get rid of one of these. Right. If you didn't want the streaming ACN variants of these, right, you could just select those items and use remove mapping. And that's all it takes. And now they're not outputting on the stream in universes anymore. Right. You didn't have to change any patch. You didn't have to clone anything or move anything around. You just remove the mapping of that output. So when we're in here, we're not changing your patch. Right. The patch is in that other window. It's where all the fixtures are. Um, that assignment is still sacrosanct. What the mapping is doing is really, it's just doing what the old patch panels did. It's like, take universe one, put it on this port, put it on this output, move it into my system this way. So I can read Aaron's question in a couple ways. Is it, um, do I want universe yeah. one through four to now be called 101 through 104? That would be something slightly different than if I want my patch universe one to now go out instead of being out on streaming ACN universe one, I want it to go on streaming ACN universe 101. That would be done in the mapping. I, I realized that I said, yes, that is correct, that I made a lot of assumptions in that answer. <laughs> um, and that's why I was like, we should bring it up here and talk about all the assumptions that was made or that were made. Yep. All right. Um... Anything else you guys want to talk about before you kind of talk about the, the last little bits? We had some, a couple of just minor changes in this update as well. Um, 
we do have, uh, I think Megan shared it in the chat, but there is a bacon bits video. So if you want a, a shorter explanation or maybe just a little more formalized video, uh, we do have a, a YouTube video on uh, this new update specifically on how you configure your outputs. Um, Matt said, what about taking in DMX from other consoles? We still don't support straight DMX in, but you can still do ArtNet input. So right there underneath input, you hit add mapping. Universe you want to map in. And there you go. But no hard line DMX in. It's still art ArtNet input to the console. We have a comment from Scott Barnes about mm -hmm. how the licenses are allocated. Can you throw together a mapping table for me? No one? Sure. For four universes? Four universes of there we go. what? Or just widget? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Okay, so there's the four that exist. Let's add a mapping for a fifth. So we have an unlicensed universe that we want to get into the mix. Just a uh, streaming ACN. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't matter. All right. So we've got four licensed outputs on the hoglet, and we've got one extra universe now that we want to bring into the system. We want it to replace one of the four that we've got licensed, one that, say, we're not using. Um, you might think that going down to universe five there and changing the license priority to two, make it two, is going to swap five and two. That's not actually what happens. Um, so what you'll notice now is universe one and two <laughs> and three and five are being output by the system. Thank you. <laughs> um, but universe four, you actually wanted to keep, right? You wanted to get rid of universe two and keep universes three and four where they were. So this isn't working the way that you might think it was going to work. And the reason for that is that license priority is about sort of a sliding scale. The idea being that rearranging one universe in that list doesn't necessarily want to remap all of the other ones um, as far as as far as how important they are to you in this list in the one, two, three, four kind of rating scale. So if you would go and put four or put five back at license priority five, that second row, second row, second row, there you go. Put that back at five. All right, so here we are back at where, where the world makes sense again, right? <laughs> what you want to do is you want to bump universe two out of the list. So if you take the license priority of, of universe two and make it five, it will drop to the bottom. It will drop now into that unlicensed space and universe one, three, four, and five will be output by the hoglet. Does that all make sense? If universe two truly isn't being used, if it's truly empty and available, you could also just remove that mapping and then you don't have to worry about it because then our new universe five would just slide up into that license space on its own. Um, but it's not a swap action. It's more like an insert and recalculate um, kind of action if you switch around the license priority because we're trying to maintain the relative positions of all of your universes. Um, which is just one of those sort of head scratcher moments that I know Scott ran into, which is why he brought it up. Um, so anyway, I hope that helps make a little sense. It's another one of those little sort of moments where you want to say, ah, this is the new workflow. But uh, keeping unused universes here in your mapping table is probably a waste of licenses. So I would, I would kick those out if they're not actively being used, um, unless they're holding space for a specific reason in your production. All right. All right. Well, I'm just going to close that out. Um, yeah, so, I think we'll finish up the Q&A. Go yeah. ahead, Megan. Oh, I was going to say, I think we're, I was saying the same thing. And then I was going to talk about the, the fun thing with OSC now. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead and switch back to the release notes again. And where are we looking at? Uh, Right underneath par, uh, universes. Scroll down. There you go. There, there you is. go. Um, so something that's nifty for you Hog4 PC users, since you know we've all been, well, at home. This is like the thirtieth webinar Noah and I have done, not from the office. <laughs> um, 
we have now with 314 unlocked the um fader and encoder and uh, hardware lock for fader and encoders for osc and midi which is pretty nifty um and this is kind of useful especially if you had like you had only bought a mini wing and that only gave you access to the faders and not the encoders for hog4 pc via midi or osc now it's just completely unlocked um yeah, and I and you just you don't have to have hardware to unlock the MIDI and OSC anymore. Or encoders and faders, I should say. And Correct. this and this will lead us into hope oh, oh, this will lead us into more MIDI things in future updates, which is great. Um yeah, so just more free unlocked stuff. Uh, keyboard mode persistence, software OS now persists to keyboard mode, whether you're in map mode or you're in ABC mode, um, through console restarts and show log offs. Just a small little uh, feature there. Uh, CITP support. So if you're using the Green Halo Hypnotizer for version 4.5, it does support CITP thumbnails, uh, previews, and the media picker of the Hog4 console. If you're using media servers, you probably know what that means. Um, we actually have one of our uh, uh, partners, which is the uh, high output, essentially. They came out with a product for, called the CMD key keyboard for HOG4. Uh, I'll actually bring a little picture up. It's pretty nifty. So this is, this is a third party device. We do not uh, produce the device. Basically, it's just a custom uh, USB keyboard with custom uh, keycaps on it. Basically, it just transfers USB commands into Hog4 PC or you know console, whatever that you need it for. Uh, when we produced this, we found a couple of, of inconsistencies with our mappings. So we have actually just produced, uh, fixed a couple of those things for uh, this keyboard specifically. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add onto that? I, I didn't have a lot to do with this. So. Um, basically, some of our uh, uh, if you're a if you're a connoisseur of our keyboard shortcuts for hog for pc or for using uh, an alpha numeric keyboard with those software um you know that sometimes things that you do as a two key command on the actual console turn into a a different command shortcut on an alpha numeric keyboard than you would get if you used the corresponding mapped keys in the same way as you would on a console so, for example, I think we found this uh, mainly in, in PIG release, but then in PIG in combination with any number of other keys in our keyboard shortcuts, um, turned into, because I think PIG was control, uh, <laughs> turned into a number of conflicting standard Windows shortcuts like undo and copy and paste and all those kinds of things. So sometimes there was a direct map, but sometimes there was not. So what we did is uh, went back and had a look at our shortcuts and... Uh, tried to add in options so that uh, a mapping of a keyboard of this type would allow you to do pig and release using the pig key and the release key and not have to make specific separate other ones uh, that do the uh, the modified shortcut that doesn't conflict with Windows commands. So that's really the, the gist of this particular change. It means that there's a few more options for how you might map a programmable keyboard. Um, we did it specifically in response to the way this keyboard is laid out, but it really applies to any mappable or programmable USB keyboard that you might make for yourself. So if you use X keys, for example, or there's a cherry keyboard that you can program yourself to make shortcut um, or, uh, you know, user defined keyboards like this one, those commands are now available to you as well. So that's what that change was about. So if you've already invested in a command key, hog keyboard from high output uh i thank you on behalf of high output <laughs> and uh it should work a little bit more smoothly for you now um and like sarah said it should work for any programmable usb keyboard there i mean if you want to like there's tons on amazon i've used like macro buttons to change to get around this exact issue before um so actually it's nice that it's gonna be i have to go and change all those macros again <laughs> um, to just be the actual key commands. Okay. Um, so this is just about wrapping up the webinar. We did have a couple of bug fixes. We do have a known issue. Um, if you're interested in testing software before it gets released, we do have a beta program. Sarah would be your best option as far as uh, getting involved in that. Uh, you could also, of course, email me or Meg and we can get you involved, but ultimately Sarah will be the final source. 
Um, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Uh, a lot of y'all know that we do have a sort of knowledge base uh, on our website. So if you were to go to our website, uh, go to support, and then uh, click on the support. There is a technical support for all your HES gear. Just want to mention that we have a really handy article in the uh, consoles section, Hog4 Software Programming, called Hull Hog4 OS Software Versions. This is one of my favorite articles of all time that we've created, and it actually lists all the changes of previous software updates. And the reason why I'm highlighting this in this webinar now is that if, let's say, that you're on software version 3.8 and you update your desk and you dump to 3.14, you might see all these new features, but there's some other things that we've added in along the way. So if you ever want to see the release notes from a previous release, you can just simply click on it. I'm using the middle mouse button here to order the new tabs. And if you want to see kind of what's been changing uh, since the last uh, opera, last software version that you were on, this is just a great way to take a look at that. And I'm going to link that in the chat for everybody. This was my baby right when we started this. I took like a solid three days to compile all of this and find all the software versions to 2.0.0. I think it's the most popular article as well. I, I think it is as well. So, yeah, it's a fantastic article if you just want to see kind of what's been happening um, over time. I think this and the how many console, how many fit universes can a hog console control, which is also another one that I the took some time on as well. And look, hey, look, HPU, we're updating a lot of these articles for 314 right now. Um, so yeah, anything else that you want to say, Sarah or, or Megan? I think that just about wraps up the new changes in 314. Uh, we're already working on 315 now and uh, expect that in a couple of months. Um, what's the new hedgehog called? Hedgehog 4X, because it's just a basically a motherboard change out on the back and you get um, a different, it's just a motherboard change out that came in with some things on the back. Um, but it is called a Hedgehog 4X. Ooh, Scott, you just gave a fantastic tip. So if you are using the HPU console, uh, there's a shortcut which will basically hide your playback bar. So like if you're just using that touch screen to navigate menus, you don't need it for like playback. You don't need to see your playback bar. Uh, the shortcut for that is uh, pig, uh, pig plus zero. And actually, I could probably show that on Hog4 PC. This is just a handy shortcut. If you ever need more room on your desk, uh, pig zero, pig zero will hide uh, the playback bar, and pig period will hide the encoder display. So if you ever need more real estate, whether you're on a hedgehog or you're on the HPU, anything that has a smaller screen, uh, you can use those shortcuts to uh, hide and show. He's got more. He's got Scott more. is currently. Uh, probably the most versed in using HPU. He was able to beta test them for us. So he's got the most uh, most real experience with uh, setting them up at this point. So we'll happily take whatever advice you want to share. He's typing furiously, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, you can move that view bar onto another display if you wanted. Um, that's the same with all the consoles, though. You can always click and drag that view bar to a different display. No, we could do it now on Hog4 PC if you opened up a another window. Um, I don't have another window. I mean, I could do... If you enabled one. I got it. Don't rush me. So, like, if you did have a physically an external monitor, you could... Oops. Oh. Uh, it does probably work. Yeah, you would have to resize, too. Sorry, I threw Noah under the bus of having to do this on the fly. There we go. Yep. So um, it is it. going to default to your primary, so you might, I don't think we hold that over through log off, so you might have to redo it, but um, it is still useful if you need it on the bigger monitor. If you're on an HPU, whatever your external monitor is, becomes primary automatically. Awesome. All right. Um, I think that wraps up the Q and A. Um, and the chat. Yeah. Ah, except the view bar. Okay. Uh, Noah, can you put the link to the release notes again? To the all the release notes, or 
Did you put the one for the whichever I'll, one? I'll link both. So there is specifically the release notes. That is that is our outline. Folks. Oh yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, I just released the outline. I'm an idiot. I can't delete that, can I? I will. Um, wrong tab. There's nothing in that link that you guys didn't already hear. So don't I, I mean, you do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, people at the beginning were asking for like show notes, basically. Like if you listen to podcasts, like show notes, so you could see what was talked about. Uh -huh. um, so I've made these to where if you share the link, it's public. That way, if people needed them, they could go back and see it. Um, and that's why it has all that stuff at the beginning with the YouTube link and stuff. Cool. Um, the joys of me being a productivity hunter. And finding new tools. Um, All right. So there we go. I wanted to look at one just one thing in here. Thank you. Um, the plot object image selection can um, can we go over that real quick? Because I think this the um, might be something that we want to talk about. Sure. Let me let me get my uh, Fox Four PC back to normal. Now that I made you ruin that one also. <laughs> All right, let's do left-hand screen. Um, yeah, so in your plot window, this is just a little minor feature. Um, we say it's minor, but I feel like it's been asked for. But... Um, so, yeah, you can add a, add a little shape here. And you can now access the thumbnail library. Make sure I'm doing this right. Thumbnail library. And so if you had a gobo that is in our thumbnail library, let's just do this pink one. That can now be added into plots. So if you wanted to have like a beam palette or something like that next to it, you could. Or if you say if you've got your your uh, soul spots and you know what gobos are on those fixtures, you could add in the two wheels so that you kind of by reference know what the gobo should be looking like. So it's just a minor feature, just basically unlock. I, I'm, I won't say minor again, I'm sorry. Um, but it basically just allows access to the thumbnail library from the plot window. Yeah, and I just, I, I wanted to just put that out there because some people, I know a lot of people have been asking like, hey, can I use what's in my media picker into my plot? Well, now you can. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just useful to put in, especially if you start doing more of those, like I, we've, I think a lot of us have seen like Scott's like plot layouts, like on Facebook groups and stuff like that. Like it can be a little bit more useful to get more images inside your plot so that you know exactly what you're about to select and stuff like that. Cool. I think that wraps it up. Yeah. Anything else? Anything in the Q and A chat? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I haven't seen anything come in. Oh, Matt, I'm going to text you in a second. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this actually is going to be our last webinar for a while. Uh, as I said, Megan, we've actually done 30 of these total since March. Uh, every, pretty much every single Thursday, I think we took one Thursday off. Uh, there might have so... been two, because I think we took off 4th of July also. Oh, okay. And... Um, <laughs> So yeah, we've done as I said, we've done thirty of these. These are all available on our YouTube channel. There's actually a separate ETC study hall YouTube channel, and then they are also on the High End Systems YouTube channel. They just linked together. Um, hopefully, it won't be the end of the webinars. We do plan on having more of these. They just won't be every week going forward. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, you can always email us support at highend.com. Uh, you can also just email us directly if you like. So first else? name dot last name at highend.com for both of us. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for if you thanks for watching all of them. Thanks for going back and watching this. Like it was really useful. Thanks, Sarah, for also joining us for this one. I'm gonna answer Matt's question before I go. And that is I'm not quite sure when the 315 beta is coming out. We are actively working on that right now. I would expect it probably after the first of the year, just because we're coming up on all the holidays and everything. Um, and as we hinted to, you're gonna see a lot of work in the area of MIDI mapping. Uh in that release and then we hope to also have some interesting uh 
work done in effects. Fun. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I'm uh, log off. All right. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.